I'm sometimes asked why the Department of State? You know, why are we interested in issues of uh, food and agriculture? And clearly, agriculture is a food security issue. We all know that. But it's also an economic security issue. It's an energy security issue. And as we learned in 2008, it's also a national security issue. So there are a lot of reasons why the Secretary of uh, State can and does care about food and agriculture. So then the second question I often get is, well, then what's the difference between what you do at the State Department and what they do at USDA? And I say, that's easy. At USDA, they do things. And at the State Department, we talk about doing things. So you're lucky, because we're going to talk about doing things today. And so I, I'm excited to be here. And I think it's an interesting opportunity. What's exciting for me is that I get to talk about the challenges, and they get to talk about the solutions. I get to talk about why this all matters, and they get to explain how to make it all happen. And so it should be a really interesting discussion, and I'm looking forward to it. So on my way here, I was uh, reading the book Collapse by Jared Diamond. And, and many of you have probably read the book. And in ma many ways, it's a cautionary tale of how societies fall apart. And the theme that runs through it, of course, is food and agriculture and environmental consequences that can lead to that destruction. And so. It's important that we reflect on that. And what's interesting to me is that when you look at the book and you read the reasons that societies collapse related to food and agriculture, they, they seldom have to do with the very uh, the minutia that we talk about when we talk about the sustainability of agriculture. And it's talking about the impact of trade. It's talking about the ability uh, of interdependence of communities. And if you lose that interdependence, then a society can collapse. On the other hand, if you don't have interdependence of communities and societies, societies can collapse. And so it's really looking at the big picture. And now today, we're, we're getting down a little bit more into the weeds. And so part of what I want to do, though, is to look at the, the big picture of food and agriculture. Because in many ways, there's nothing we do that has a bigger impact on the planet than agriculture, and yet there's nothing more critical for our daily survival. So I'm going to go quickly through a lot of these things, because they're all things that you know. 40% of all the arable land on Earth is already used for agriculture. So 40% of all the land we could use for ag is being used for ag. The amount of cropland is about the size of South America. The amount of pasture land is about the size of Africa. So in terms of land, I think that it's pretty clear that we really don't need to be using more land for food and agriculture. If we were to talk about water, well, we all know that 70% of fresh water goes to agriculture. This is the Aral Sea back in 1973. And as we fast forward to today, we can see that it's no longer really a sea at all. Now, this isn't just somebody else's problems. This conference is taking place in the southwest United States, where they know better than most the importance of water. The Colorado Re River, one of the largest rivers in the United States, no longer flows to the sea. So these aren't the problems of 2050. These are the challenges of today. If we were to talk about climate change, well, 25 to 30 percent of all greenhouse gases come from agriculture. That's 10 or 15 percent directly, and another 10 to 15 percent from deforestation, 80 percent of which is caused by agriculture. Now, when we read about uh, climate change in the newspaper, it seems that 90 percent of the articles or about energy policy. And yet, when you look at this, there's almost as much contribution from agriculture as there is from energy, and yet there's very little discussion. On the other hand, for every dollar you invest in wind and solar, you get less than a dollar back because they're less efficient than fossil fuels. Those are critical long-term investments for our future. Nobody can deny that. On the other hand, for every dollar you invest in agriculture, you get $1.43 back everywhere in the world. So you have to wonder, would consumers rather pay more for their energy or less for their food to get a cleaner environment? From what I know of Americans, they'd rather eat their way to a cleaner environment. <laughs> this isn't being recorded, right? Oh. Uh, we'll get that in post-production. So it's important when it comes to climate change. If we, were to talk, if we talk about population growth, again, all the numbers are things that you know. We're going from 7 billion people to nine, nine and a half billion people by 2050. That's adding 75 million people a year. Now, we all need to eat, and yet 800 million people are going to bed hungry today. Nine million people a year will die of hunger. 
That's a number that's really hard to wrap our minds around. It's a little easier to think in terms of 25,000 people a day dying of hunger, or 1,000 people in the next hour, or one person every four seconds. What can you say that's important enough for one person to be dying every four seconds? So we need 60%, some say 80, 90, 100% more food by 2050, and we need to do it using less land, less water, less fertilizer, less pesticides. So we have to do everything better tomorrow than we're doing it today, and our rivers and lakes are already running dry. So this is a tremendous challenge. So if you look at the world back in uh, 1950, you saw that most people lived in countries that were mostly rural. And then as you fast forward to today, what you find is that about half the world lives in countries that are mostly urban, and half the world lives in countries that are mostly rural. Uh, yeah, urban and rural. But if you fast forward to 2050, what we're going to find is that most of the people will live in countries that are mostly urban. So we're becoming further and further removed from how our food is produced. And because of that, there are challenges in communication. If you ask people, how much do you know about how your food is produced, people in cities say they have a better understanding than people that live in rural communities. That might not be true. They think they do. So let's think about what is sustainability? Well, naturally, I turn to the Code of Federal Regulations because I'm a lawyer. And I found a definition that's somewhat helpful. So it talks about uh, plant and animal pra production practices at site-specific application. That's an important term. We'll come back to it. But it's to satisfy human needs, enhance environmental quality, use resources efficiently, and then sustain economic viability of farms. And you can't see the last part there. Um, how the slide came out, I'm not sure what happened. Um, but it talks about uh, enhanced quality of life for people and society. Now, the two important parts of that, though, are, uh, again, I'm sorry how the slides turned out. Uh, the formatting changed a little bit. That it's the site-specific application that's important, and it's enhancing the quality of life for society that's important. Because we already already think of those things of satisfying human needs, environmental quality. Those are things we think of all the time. But the idea that enhancing the uh, society at specific locations, this is, this is an application of the idea, think globally and act locally. So again, what is sustainability? Well, it's a tough question when you try to put it into practice. Because if you have a certain amount of water a farmer uses and a certain amount of fertilizer a farmer uses, and the farmer uses less of those in the second year, I think we can all say that that farm is more sustainable. But what happens if the farmer uses less water but a little bit more fertilizer? Is, sorry about that. So is that farm more sustainable or is it less sustainable? Well, the answer, of course, is it depends. Is it a farmer here in the Southwest? Well, you might say that that is a more sustainable farm. Is it a farmer on the Chesapeake Bay? Well, you'd probably say that farmer is not being more sustainable. We need to reduce the fertilizer even if we don't reduce water because water isn't particularly short supply in that region. So when we're trying to define sustainability, it is site specific. And so you can't have a global standard for what sustainability is because it really depends on where the person is practicing that agriculture. And so this is something hopefully we'll come back through over the course of the day. So how these things get put into practice, people's different perspectives of the world. So we have these competing worldviews. On one hand, there are people who believe that we need to be going, moving slower, that we need to produce food in a softer footprint, that we need to go back and do things the way we did it in the past. On the other hand, there's a push towards more technology, the application of more intensive agriculture more intensive on a smaller location instead of a larger area with a softer footprint. And so these are two important global trends. On one hand, you have the slow food movement. On the other hand, you have liberalized trade. And this is important. Now, 
France is in the point is in the process of looking at these questions too. And so, uh, at the bottom there it says towards an agriculture of high performance, towards an agriculture of greater sustainability. And the interesting thing for me is how do they frame getting there? They frame they have two questions that they ask. The first question is how can organic farming farming be more productive and competitive? The second question they ask is how can the transition be made from conventional to more sustainable forms of agriculture. And so in the first one, they frame it as a positive. How can organic be better? And in the second one, how can a bad thing be made less bad? So they want to make a good thing better. And, and so they chose to frame it in a certain way. There's a bad guy and a good guy in this discussion. And yet, the organic farms, even in France, is a small number of farmers, and the conventional is the majority of farmers. And so it's pitting the urban dwellers against the, ur the rural dwellers in their definition of what farming and agriculture is. And so as you're trying to achieve sustainable agriculture, you need to see who are you pitting against each other or who are you trying to engage in cooperation. Framing matters as you learned yesterday. And so what are the implications of these choices? Well, if you go back to 1961 and you look at how much food was being produced in many European countries, in the United States, China, India, and Brazil, and then you fast forward, you fast forward to 2005, what you see is that China's really taken off in its production. The United States and, uh, and India are, are pulling away from the pack. And then you look at, and you can see that Brazil is sort of beginning to pull away. But European agricultural production has not increased a lot. Since, uh, since 19, or 1965, and so, or 61. So the question is, is that because Europe doesn't need more food? Well, no, no. The country that sends the most food to Europe is Brazil. The number one export destination for Brazil is Europe. So over the next 10 years, European agriculture will increase by just under 4%, just ahead of sub-Saharan Africa. On the other hand, Brazil will increase its agricultural production by 40% driven by demand in Europe. So the question is, are these policies in Europe making Europe more sustainable? Does society include the world or does it just include you and me? And so these are part of the questions we need to ask when we're talking about what is sustainability. Is it sustainability for the farm? Is it sustainability for the country, or is it sustainability for the planet? Because our choices have consequences. And if we choose to go not intensive agriculture locally, somebody else will meet that demand. We'll come back to these questions as well. I like to say that people love innovation almost as much as they despise change. And this really reflects a lot of the, the angst that people have when we talk about food and agriculture. People aren't anti-science, they're not anti-technology. Most of you probably have your smartphone in your pocket if it fits. But we also like things to stay the same, and no place do we like them to stay the same more than in the food we eat. But sometimes we are adventurous, we try new foods. So how do you frame a discussion so that food becomes an area of our life where we want innovation, or how do we frame farming in a way that without innovation, everything will change? Now, I think it's fair to say that consumers in many ways are skeptical of businesses and they're skeptical of governments, and so we have to figure out how to better communicate with them. And when you ask people about the direction of agriculture, sometimes they're, they're worried that agriculture is going in the wrong direction. And I think that's an interesting feeling because when you look at how, much, how many resources go into producing a bushel of corn, what you find is that we use 40% less land to produce a bushel, 60% less soil erosion, 50% less water, and 40% less energy, and 35% fewer greenhouse gases between 1980 and 2011. And we could use a similar slide for canola and cotton and soy. Farmers are doing everything better today than they were doing it before. This is a good news story. And yet the feeling among people is that it's not going in the right direction. And so 
one of the challenges is that people don't really focus that much on science. And again, you probably heard a little bit about that yesterday. And so when we talk about sustainability, we can look at different types of agricultures playing different roles. On one hand, organic agriculture may have lower productivity, but it can also have a lower impact. Conventional agriculture has higher productivity, but it may have a higher local impact. There isn't one or the other that's going to help us get where we need to be. We need to figure out how to take the best of each type of agriculture for what it's worth. And currently the dialogue doesn't really allow a lot of room for that kind of discussion. But I think the public is perfectly amenable to that. And so how we talk about these issues is really important. So science communication. In June, I was at the American Meat Science Association annual conference. People always laugh when I say meat scientists. And I'm not sure, uh, science, I'm not sure why. There are 800 meat scientists there. And I told them, I said, I have some really bad news for you. If people don't trust you, science doesn't matter. And if people do trust you, science doesn't matter. <laughs> you need to stop telling people what you do and start telling them why you do it. Because science tells us that if you introduce science at the beginning of a conversation, all you do is polarize your audience. Those who agree with you agree with you more. Those who disagree with you disagree with you more. And you've lost them. So you can actually end your conversation with people less convinced and also less trusting of you. How we talk about things matters. And that's part of why I talk about things in the order that I do by talking about the challenges of agriculture before we talk about the opportunities of agriculture, we help people to recognize that we get it. We can acknowledge that there are definitely challenges with the way agriculture is produced. We're all on the same page with 90% of what I say. And if we disagree on one or two things, well, that's OK. We can still figure out a way to work with it. Whereas if you start with something somebody disagrees with, they won't hear anything else you say. So, that brings me to sort of why now matters. And we're going to talk about sustainability, but what I really want to talk about is why this moment is so critical. Now, if we were to talk about uh, population growth back in the 1960s, you know, we'd all be talking about the population bomb and the fact that global population is growing and it's going to cause famines and destruction, and we might as well write off the rest of the developing world today. And yet, the Green Revolution came along, and that didn't happen. But we're still going from 7 to 9 billion people, and so the population is still growing. Well, I'm not going to talk to you about peak oil, but I want to use the analogy. We often think this idea of peak oil, that the amount of food or amount of oil being produced, at some point, it's going to start to grow or decrease. We're going to have pumped that barrel of oil, and after that, production's going to go down. Now, they said it in the 60s, and they said it in the 80s, and they said it in the 2000s. I don't know if we have reached peak oil. I don't know if we will ever reach peak oil. But what I do know is we have reached peak child. I don't hear any excitement. We've reached peak child. OK, well, what does that mean? All right. Well, peak child is the idea that at some point, the number of children born in a given year will reach its peak. And after that, the number of children born each year will begin to decline. Well, according to the UN Development uh, Population Division, and according to statistician Hans Rosling, 2014 was the year of peak child. The number of children born in 2000 is the most children that will ever be born in a given year throughout human history. It's downhill after that. In 1950, there were five or six children born for every woman. Today, it's less than two and a half, and it's continuing to decline. So how did that happen? Well, you may be wondering, how can we go from 7 billion people to 9 billion people if we're not having more babies, huh? 
Good question. Well, it's because people are living longer. They're not dying. That's a good news story. It's because you and me, we're still going to be there in 2050. Why? Because of better health and nutrition. And that's what brings us back to the topic that today. Better health and nutrition. That two billion people, they're going to be here because they're already here. It's you and me. And so this is an exciting opportunity because what it means is that if we can maintain the productivity we need between today and 2050 to get there without cutting down our forest and without draining our rivers, lakes, and aquifers, in many ways, we're good forever. Because think about it, if productivity continued to increase after 2050, for the first time in human history, we don't need more food. We can take those productivity gains and we can turn them around and we can use them to decrease the amount of land. We can actually use less water. We can use less fertilizer. Remember between 1980 and 2011, we used 50% less water to produce the food that we do, or uh, produce a bushel of corn. Imagine if between 2050 and 2100, we could produce the same amount of food with 50% less water. We'd be using less water in 2100 than we do today. But it requires that we get to 2050 without screwing things up. So I would like to leave you with the thought that the next 40 years is not just the most important 40 years we've ever had in the history of agriculture. The next 40 years is the most important 40 years we will ever have in the history of agriculture. That's why now matters. We need to get it right today. So what is sustainable agriculture? I don't know. I don't know that you can define sustainable agriculture. You can define more sustainable agriculture. I know that when I see it. But we can't get too hung up on the question of what is truly sustainable because it means different things to different people in different places. And we need to accept that kind of uncertainty. But as long as we're all doing things a little bit better every day, we have a chance of getting where we need to be. So thank you for your attention.